Hello, I'm Kirsty Young. Thank you for downloading this podcast of Desert Island Discs from BBC Radio 4. For rights reasons, the music choices are shorter than in the radio broadcast. For more information about the programme, please visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4. My castaway this week is Johnny Vegas. As a stand-up comic, he made his name as one of the most unpredictable and brilliant acts on the circuit. His stage persona, a self-pitying drunk, belligerently heckling an audience who at times were unclear if they were watching a well-honed comedy act or witnessing a genuine breakdown. These days, with his stand-up work behind him and after a good degree of success as an actor, he describes himself as an entertainer. He's also consigned his heavy drinking to the past and lost a third of his body weight, both part of a plan to ensure he reaches the ripe old age of 40 and can be a proper father to his young son. He once said, I always consider myself creatively at my best when at odds with the world. You once said that. I'm wondering now if you still feel that way, that it's always better to be the the grit in the oyster. I think it was certainly right for Johnny as a character... I think it does, but I'd run out of anger. Right. And I think people can see when something is genuine and when something's manufactured. And although I always enjoyed mixing facts with a little bit of fiction, there is a point where you go, life's actually turned around and been very good to me. You have lost a lot of weight. How much weight have you lost? I'm not entirely sure because I didn't weigh myself before I started, but it would have been possibly four stone, five. Mm. I was just judging it by trouser size. I mean, that's a slightly more generous with the with the sizes. So yes, I know. Getting down to a 38 was a big whoop and holler moment for me from the changing room. When I was uh, introducing you there, I used the name Johnny Vegas. Of course, it's a stage name. Of course, you weren't born Johnny Vegas. And interesting that you refer to, to Johnny Vegas there in the third person. Do you feel comfortable as me introducing you with that name or do you feel it should be your real name? No, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it because to a lot of people, that's who I am. Yeah, but that represents a certain thing, doesn't it? It represents that guy who sort of was on the edge and, as I say, there was that... Is this for real? Is this guy absolutely losing the place here and am I witnessing it? Or is it a beautifully confected, honed stage act? Well, I think with Johnny, what started off as something very well constructed with absolute parameters, there was a danger point of other things in your life seeping in where the lines were blurred for the wrong reasons. Right. So your your life started to imitate your art, as it were? Yeah. I found a, a popularity through self-destruction. Suddenly, the more you damage yourself, the more yes. people are drawn to you. And that can be quite addictive. You're trapped by your own creation, and that creation is very destructive for you as an individual. It is, when you when you realise that it's not a lifestyle you could maintain. There could hardly be a more appropriate opening uh, disc, then. T- tell me what it is you've chosen. The... the this job chosen first is, is Johnny Cash and uh, Hurt. I chose this because I, I think it's all about legacy. And again, having a son now, and I think it was Dean Martin, I think it was his, his family, but you see a lot of these shows where the children have had very little to do with the parents, and yet the children are expected to, well, the parents, it's these great entertainers who gave everything away to the public but gave nothing back to the, to their own family and I didn't want that for my own son and I didn't want that for my family and the people closest to me they've got to know that they come first and that I, oh, I don't want to leave my son with just a pile of reviews from Edinburgh I want to be his dad who can guide him in the same way that my father guided me everyone I know goes away in the year. and you could have it all my empire of dirt I will let you down I will make you 
That was Johnny Cash and Hurt. So, Johnny Vegas, um, you mentioned there your father and the kind of father that he's been to you. When you were a little boy, well, you, your dad was a joiner. Yeah. And your mum was, was she at home? Yeah, my mum my uh, stayed at home or did various cleaning jobs as, as and when they, they came along. You famously used to do a bit in your stand-up about um, eating the pet rabbit. Oh, I heard it and I laughed and I obviously thought it was a joke. I learn from reading the cuttings that it wasn't a joke. What happened? It was one of those mornings that my dad got us up for school. As we were leaving the school, he went, right, whose rabbit's going in the pot today? I genuinely thought he was joking because it was, it was such a ridiculous concept. Came in from school and he was out in the back cleaning out the hutch and I sort of looked around the garden and asked my dad where it was and he went, it's, it's there. And I looked up behind me and it was, it was skinned and hanging up. I couldn't quite believe it, so I, I, there was no tears, I didn't react. My sister went absolutely berserk and my mum. Did they? Yeah. And my dad had always claimed that, that rabbits were livestock, but we'd never eaten one before. My dad had been laid off. That might have been not in itself a breakdown or something, but I just wonder if it was a man at the end of his tether. How aware were you then, um, throughout your childhood, that money was a, was a very, or a lack of money was a, was a big shadow? I was very aware. There was a definite incident one day when I was nagging my dad over an ice cream and nagging and nagging. He took me outside to the end of the street and just said to me, I, I, I got laid off today. There'd been other children at school whose dads had been laid off and there was that little bit of dread of, you know, kids coming back in the same school uniform, pants, yeah, yeah. getting shorter and the nicknames, you know, pov and things. That, and then he, he went, so, look, here's some money, get an ice cream, but do me a favour, don't ask me for a while. The last thing I wanted then, I, I, I felt like such a little git for, you know what I mean? For, yeah. Sorry, you know what I mean? I, I yeah. just felt awful. I felt like this spoiled brat then who'd been nagging and nagging and nagging and I should have understood and I didn't. How old would you have been then? I'd have been about nine. Right. Within a year, I'd have been heading off to, to seminary school. There was a lot of equipment and uniform and things that you needed to have. There was a realisation that, although they were, they were trying to keep it from me, that that was bankrupt in them. I want to talk to you much more about seminary school and all that entailed in just a second. Johnny, tell me, what's your next record then? My next record is uh, it's Deacon Blue and Dignity. Both my parents held themselves to a very difficult time, and throughout the 80s, being unemployed, and I think every day must just have been that heartbreaking thought of where's, where's the next bit of money coming from. They, they just got on, but they got on with it, an amazing amount of dignity, and, and we came through it remarkably well, when it could have been, you know what I mean, it could have been a lot worse, and it must have destroyed a lot of other families. That was Deacon Blue and Dignity. So there you are, Johnny Vegas. You're the youngest of four children. Yeah. You're living in St Helens in Lancashire, and you decide, or, or do you decide, or do your parents decide, that life in a seminary is the life for you? How does that come about? It came about from my saying that I wanted to be a priest from a young age. But I think saying it because I enjoyed the reaction that it got. What reaction did it get? Oh, it was fantastic. The ambition of every parish is to produce its own priest. But I'd, I know for certain my mum really didn't want me to go. How do you know that she's told you that now? Th that's come out in conversations now. And I, I think with a lot of 
the negative press of late, I think it's something that my mum suspected. Right. So she was thinking, I'm sending my little boy away to I know not what. Yeah. Right. And what sort of little boy were you then? I mean, did you like football? Did you play around with your brothers and sisters? Yeah, and... I was pretty much the happy-go-lucky nine-year-old kid, really. Um, academically quite promising. I had a lovely life. And so at 11 you go to the seminary, and what's that like? What are your memories? It really hadn't sunk in what was happening until the first night. You're in this big, imposing school in its own grounds, you know what I mean? It was, it was, I, I, I suppose everybody else was, was, was just horrendously homesick. It was shell shock. And how quickly did you realise that maybe I don't want to be a priest after all? I think there was a series of events that made me realise I, I didn't want to be a priest. I didn't like the regime. It just seemed to be a place that wanted to strip you of any individuality. And so how quickly did you come home? I left in the fourth term. I, I stuck out my first year and for me the place had very little to do with religion and a lot more to do with regime. I'd come home for Christmas and we'd gone to Benediction and we were due to drive back that evening and I turned to my dad and told him that I didn't want to go back and my mum was in floods of tears and the worst thing is at the time I thought I'd broke her heart by leaving and it was quite the opposite as it turns out it was such a relief for her and was there any sort of local, small-scale disgrace in the boy coming home from the seminary? I felt like there was. I felt on me. I felt on myself that I'd I'd let a lot of people down. Everything in my life has been about you laugh things off, you make a joke. It's very hard because things there were things that went on at that school. It was very difficult to come back at weekends and people say, "What you're doing is a wonderful thing." And you quietly going, it's not a wonderful thing and it's not a wonderful place. Were you abused there? I wasn't, no. Right. But you, and it's a very difficult thing to talk about in public because for people who are or were, it's. Is it really up to me to drag that into the spotlight? No. And discuss that? I suppose what I am asking is there was a level of activity there that even as a young boy you were aware of that other yeah. people were going through yeah right and it I think like I say when I left there was for a long time I felt very guilty as I say when I left I almost wanted to take everybody else mm -hmm. with me we're going to take a break let's have some music then tell me about what you're we're on disc number three now Johnny what are you going to choose the track I've chosen now is Love Rain, Oh Me. The Who is one of them bands I could have chosen any song, but this one in particular was at a point where I was somebody who was the most unsuccessful teenager with women. This this was a love song that also contained all my frustrations, having been every, every girl's best friend, but not the bloke they actually wanted to kiss. Mm -hmm. That makes you yearn to the sky Only love can bring the rain That falls like tears from all high Love That was The Who and Love Rain Over Me Johnny Vegas, comedian, actor, ceramicist. Seems unlikely, doesn't it? Yeah. How did, how did ceramics come into your life? Uh, ceramics came into my life because I'd struggled to to fit in. I just wanted to be the normal kid. Once once I got back home, I want you know what I mean. I wanted to drink cider, stand by bus stops, do everything everybody else did. I just had this thing hanging over me of that's the priest boy. 
I, I just wanted to blend in. Were you funny? Did you make people laugh? I don't think I was. And there was little bits of entertainment. I, you know, play my nose in class and play some. You'd play what in class, did you say? I used to play my nose. That was my little entertainment piece. As a musical instrument? Yeah. What did you play? I played an Hawaiian tune, and I had a quiet ambition to get on That's Life. Sounds like you should have made it. I finished school with with a few O-levels, but I think, you know, it was very disappointing in terms of what I academically should have been able to achieve. My sister, in the meantime, pushed ahead with her, went away and did... Uh, studied fashion. She can't pave the way to go to college. None of us had, had, had been to college before. And when I went to sixth form, it was the first classroom, the first environment where a teacher basically said, you come in and work when you want. You couldn't get me out of that. You said uh, earlier that, just like a lot of teenage boys, you know, you wanted to hang around the bus shelter and drink cider. I mean, were you were you drinking at that point in your life, sort of um, in a committed way? I was when I could get the money, yeah. Right. And how did you manage for money at university then? Did you have enough cash? I did. I got a full grant. Um, my dad had warned me before I'd left to try and save some money because what they'd experienced with Catherine was there was a lot of people there from far better off backgrounds than us. And I was I was quite blasé about that until I, I, I got there and I, I ran up a lot of debt in my first year but then in the second year the party was over there was no money and my, my, my family couldn't afford to send me that money and suddenly a friend in need is a pest god forgive me it was a very bad time when i started to resent my parents I, I, I resented when i first went there i resented my parents for not being able to support me but yeah i, I graduated and then realized it wasn't the most commercially uh, successful move I've ever made. A what? degree in ceramics. When have I ever gone into the door and they've had a card upside Teapot Mender? <laughs> I sat on the train with my dad and I just went, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> Which after four years and putting them through all that financial pressure is not really what you want to hear from your graduate son, is it? Let's have some music then, Johnny. Fingers. Yes, what please. We're gonna... <laughs> what are we going to hear? We're going to hear Pulp and Common People. When, when I was at college, there was a lot of resentments building up that I was only really aware of when I started doing Johnny Vegas and, and, and performing. One of them was inverted snobbery, and it was a resentment of these people who, who just had everything. If you called your daddy, could stop it all, and... My daddy couldn't. And this song came along and just said it perfectly. Thank you, Pulp. <laughs> Thank you, Jarvis. And then in 30 seconds time, she said, I want to live like common people. I want to do whatever common people do. want to sleep with common people. I want to sleep with common people like you. What else could I do? I said, oh, I'll see what I can do. That was Pulp and Common People. You said thank you to Jarvis Cocker there. Jarvis, of course, in that song, gets the girls. You were saying at school you didn't get the girls. Did it help at university that you were one of the common people? Did it attract the ladies? It didn't. I'd got to an edge in my life of being, what, 22, 28, without ever having had a girlfriend. I'd actually reached a point in my life where I thought I was I was just going to be single and that that just wasn't meant for me. That I wasn't a relationships sort of person that I perhaps was better off on my own. I, I, I pretty much just resigned myself to the fact that women didn't see me in the same way that I saw them. I'm imagining when you became, uh, even when you started to become well-known in the comedy circuit, that all changed. I mean, you know, people like somebody who's well-known and up on it, stage. It did. Did that make you cynical about what was happening, though, because you knew that there you had been, the, this this friend of so many women, but lover of none, who suddenly was able to attract women? It did, but the, I think the, 
the relief. <laughs> Quite literally. <It's> far out weird. <laughs> the pessimism. <laughs> um, again, I, I think what what came together was I met somebody at the time that was very nice and very understanding, and so I didn't fall into the the groupy lifestyle. It was 1997 then, that was sort of your breakthrough year, that was when you were nominated for a, a Perrier um, and you were named most promising newcomer. I mean, I, I described it as your breakthrough moment. Were you conscious of that at the time it was happening? I, I think so, and I, I think it, it established me outside of the North West. As a festival, it, it was brilliant. Within three days, we'd, we'd sold, we'd pretty much sold out the run. I loved it. It was just one long, very hard party with the gigs thrown in for good measure, you know what I mean? Everything came together and people got it. Everybody was getting it. Critics were getting it. Audiences were loving it. Perfect. Let's have another piece of music then. Track number five. Track number five is Colin Hay and it's it's waiting for my real life to begin. This has become a song in the, in the past few years that in in darker moments this is a song that you've got to believe that you're going to come through. If it's not enough for the circuit yourself, then for other people. It's given me that little bit of a push to just get off my backside and get on with it. And you say, be still, my love. Open up your heart. Let the light shine in. Don't you understand? I already have a plan I'm waiting for my real life to begin Colin Hay and waiting for my real life to begin. So Johnny Vegas, um, you became this, uh, to pick out a cutting, you know, the hell-raising heavyweight comic rarely seen without a pint of Guinness in his hand. That was your identity. That was the identity people paid tickets to see. That was why you got on TV. That's what people wanted from you. They did. Whilst I was trying to craft Vegas, my usual approach was to just get as drunk as possible. And I mean, I can count one hand the times that I've gone on stage as Johnny without a drink. At its worst, how badly did the drinking affect your life? I mean, what were the points at which things were out of control? I think there was a period in my life after college when I I became so resentful, even towards friends for. There was nothing happening in my life, but I wasn't making anything happen. I'd always drunk to socialise, I'd always, you know, pubs with a, with, with a cult trip, everything centred around the pub. But this wasn't, this was drinking in a room on your own and blaming the world for you not being where you thought you should be. But then, oddly enough, the career took you back towards that path of, of you know, I thought I could, maybe it was arrogant that I thought I could go out and play the hell is it? but then put Johnny back in his box mm. and I think within my personal life I went through a separation and a divorce and I think I was just I was burning bridges with people because I wanted people to know I was desperately upset What sort of a husband were you? I don't honestly think it lasted long enough to find out How long were you married for? Less than well, less than two years. Right. I think it, from a relationship like that, it's, it's not being guarded about it. I think it's one of those things that when it's very bitter, it'd be a long time before you can sit down and actually look at your own mistakes within a relationship, like within within a marriage. Are you not drinking now? Or are you... I do drink now. For me, drink has, has served me wonderfully. It helped me create Johnny. I see it as, as something that's done a lot for me, but something that can turn on you at any moment and take it all back. I enjoy a drink and I, and I always wanted to be able to enjoy a drink and I never wanted the drink to get to a point where you go, it's either the drink or nothing else. Do you know what I mean? That you, yeah. if, you, if you can't strike that happy balance between going out and that being a part of your socialising but not a part of your everyday existence, and can you strike the balance? I think I can. But I'm also, again, very afraid when I was talking about my parents before. 
I know they came through difficult situations. I can strike that balance when things are going good. Are you a strong enough personality to be able to strike that balance under emotional duress? And are you? In the past, couldn't really say I've come through with flying colours. Let's have some music then. I am fun as well sometimes. <laughs> I should point that out. <laughs> I come in here and I'm incredibly earnest, you know, then you go, I like balloons. Do you right. Oh, so sorry, yeah, sorry. Right, yeah, the next song, The Beautiful South and It's Domino Man. This is really a tribute to pubs and that pub culture. Through ugly pints and Sunday breath Sit men who stare as cold as death To wide lapels and glued up pies To made up kids and made up wives Sitting in the heart of them Is a man who's not like other men Don't you know just who I am? Not a wink I am the domino man That was The Beautiful South and Domino Man. You are now, Johnny Vegas, of course, a well-respected actor. The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist, uh, Bleak House, Happiness. Benidorm was the big ITV hit, watched by nine million people. Um, did you decide to become an actor, or did people just call your agent and say, I think you might be quite good at this? It was something I quietly wanted to do, but um, without having the formal training... I didn't really feel very confident about putting myself out there and saying I want to act because I thought if you can't do it. Did you feel quite self-conscious to be in groups of serious proper actors? I always have and it's something I've never really got to grips with. You still do? Yeah. I always felt like I'd, I was never fully doing justice to something that somebody else had written. Your parents didn't come to see you do your stand-up but I'm imagining they watch the stuff you do on TV. Yeah, they do. Um, what do they think of it? Well, they love it. I mean, it's really nice to finally do something, like with Benidorm, something that everyone can discuss without bringing shame upon the family. Is she? You say she's supportive. Is she proud? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very. Because um, you live in St Helens. Is that where you... Are you based there? Are you based at home I'm, in your hometown? I'm, I'm based in between St Helens and Dublin at the moment. Right. But yes, my home is, is St. Helens. Right. And Dublin is for reasons um, of it's love. My, my, yeah, my fiancé lives in Dublin, so... I travel between the two. My son lives in London but comes up to the northwest when we have time together. And that sounds like quite a logistically complex life, you're living there. Dublin it, it, and the northwest and London. And... It is, but it's, it's a life that makes me very happy. I'm very contented with the way life is at the moment, so... I get by. Let's have some more music then. Disc number seven. Number seven is It's the Lars and There She Goes. Now, for some reason, I've probably come across as so melancholy while I've been talking to you. I love love songs. I live for love, and, it, and it, it's such an influential presence in my life from somebody who told himself, you know what I mean, that this probably wouldn't be for me and that relationships would... would, would that That just wouldn't happen. I think from being somebody who was a loner and, and probably got off on the notion of being a loner, I now have a lady in my life that, that just, that smile makes the day. Somebody that can come along and make you realise that my life isn't best lived on my own. And with Michael, I love my son till the day I die. Nothing can ever change that. Whether I've struggled through my faith, through drinking, through anything, just that one guarantee has made the world a difference to my life. And I'm not a misery guts, so here we are with the Lars and there she goes.
That was the Lars, a happy song, Johnny Vegas, and there she goes. And what about the the, the life that you've hinted at, that life of, of the performer? You, you've talked a, a bit about your son, uh, Michael. And the feeling is, what, that you don't want to give up your life to performing only for him to think, well, that's my dad, but I hardly know him. Yeah, that that's it, exactly. And it's... I, I, it can be... The, the performance side of your life, it... it it can be a very shallow existence, and I just couldn't forgive myself if he if he thought he came second, because I always did with my parents. You're forty this year, then. <laughs> How's just, that? Yeah. How does forty feel? Um, a lot better than I actually expected. I've actually made it. That was one point in my life. I actually thought, will I will I reach forty? I hope it's the start of a far less traumatic chapter. I would like the forties to just to be that period of, of focusing on on the people closest to me. Tell me what your final record is then. Final record is, is Don McLean, Vincent's. And I chose this because growing up I, I tended to listen to music that was knocking about the house with my siblings but I was very fortunate there was some quality music lying around and Don McLean especially now I, I sit down and I, I, I'm trying to do a lot more writing now and I both I almost love and loathe him because if I could just write one of these lines at any point in my life you know create anything as beautiful as, as, as a song like this um I could professionally walk away a very happy man. Now I understand What you tried to say to me And how you suffered for your sanity And how you tried to set them free They would not listen, they did not know how Perhaps they'll listen now. That was Don McLean and Vincent. So, Johnny, it comes to the point then where I'm going to give you a copy of the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. And what's your book going to be that you'll take to the island? I will take A Ragged Child's Philanthropist. I learn something from it every time. Okay, well, that's every your Every time book. I read it, it's yours and a luxury too. A kiln. A kiln? A kiln. Uh, a, a pottery kiln. Yeah. I, Although when I finished at college, I was never financially going to feed myself or look after anybody for what I made. I really miss it. It's an incredibly therapeutic thing to do. Let's hope it's clay-based soil then. A kiln is yours. And if you had to choose just one of these eight discs today, which one disc would you save? Oh, no. Um, it would be Johnny Cash and, and, and Hurt. It's yours. Johnny Vegas, thank you very much for letting us hear your Desert Island discs. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a download from the BBC. You'll find more information on the Radio 4 website, bbc.co.uk slash radio4.